So, ladies and gentlemen, um, we would like to start this session. We have an uh, interesting session uh, pertaining to eating disorders. We will first uh, summarize uh, clinical findings on body weight uh, during uh, both uh, um, the course of anorexia and bulimia nervosa. This talk will be presented by myself. My co-chair, Beate hapas dalman from the University of Aachen, will be here shortly. She is chairing a poster session, I am told, and uh, thus uh, we will have to excuse her till she comes back later. Now, the second talk will be on the uh, neuroendocrine regulation of body weight, findings in both anorexia nervosa and bulimia, uh, presented by Christian Holtkamp. He is working at the department of Professor Habertz Dahlmann in Aachen. And the uh, symposium will be concluded by Anke Hinay, who will talk about genetic findings in obesity and their implication for eating disorders. Uh, she works at the department in Essen, too. So um, I will have the honor of presenting clinical data on, um, on body weight regulation in both eating disorders. And I would like to start off by presenting the goals of my talk. I want you to understand the uh, relationship between pre-morbid BMI and BMI at referral for inpatient treatment in adolescent patients. This, uh, these aspects pertain only to adolescents. We, I'm not aware of a single study that has looked at these aspects in adult patients. We will then continue by looking at the long-term prognostic significance of BMI at referral in adolescent patients. I will address major limitations of follow-up studies, and we will talk about the practical implications of uh, the use of BMI centiles uh, when you are treating patients with eating disorders. Now, first to show how body weight is classified uh, in adults, and this is what you usually uh, see. This is a standard categorization proposed by the WHO back in 1998. Actually, the same classification scheme had existed uh, prior to that. And as you can see, underweight here is defined by a BMI of below 18.5. And then you have the normal weight range. You have overweight defined as BMI above 25. And you have the uh, pre-obese and then three obese classes. Um, just to uh, go to underweight here, uh, you can see, of course, that the risk of comorbidities for uh, disorders associated with uh, obesity are low, but the risks of, risks of other clinical problems are uh, increased. Now, unfortunately, a lot of work, of course, on body weight regulation has been done in the obese, but there is only very limited work uh, being performed in underweight weight individuals. Now, you're all very well familiar with the uh, A criterion of uh, body for, 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 the, for anorexia nervosa, DSM-4, or TR, weight criterion for a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa. And please note, I will just try to address two aspects. One will be the term refusal. I'll just briefly, very briefly, I can't leave out a talk without actually pertaining to this word here. Uh, and then afterwards, I will uh, go to, through uh, this uh, somewhat complicated um, way of addressing underweight in individuals with anorexia and nervosa. You can see weight loss leading to maintenance of body weight less than 85% of that expected or failure to make expected weight gain during period of growth leading to weight, body weight less than 85% of that expected. Sorry. Now, refusal. Um, just briefly, this is a sort of an intermittent slide. Um, I'm somewhat concerned that the word refusal is not appropriate in uh, terms of anorexia nervosa. And uh, we should, in, in general, I think, be well aware that in no other psychiatric disorder uh, do we use the term refusal. And as you can see, I just... Uh, simplistically wrote that the uh, depressive patient doesn't refuse to think in a more optimistic manner. That would be uh, sort of applying the same approach or the same criterion to depression. Or if you look at an obese patient, of course, uh, that you would never think of this obese individual as refusing to have a normal body weight. 
And if you go through this even more thoroughly, then you will think of refusal as evidently implying an active, uh, conscious, and willful psychological process, uh, which I think we have to be very critical of whether or not our patients that we see with anorexia nervosa indeed uh, fulfill this um, implication of refusal. In addition, we can uh, see or consider that um, refusal can be perceived as conveying a somewhat paternalistic attitude in that uh, we are actually inferring this uh, uh, behavior uh, to, in, into the patients and uh, we have not really been um, discussing with them whether or not this term actually applies to them. Then, of course, if you think of dsm 4 or classification schemes, we should be well aware of that all of psychiatry, uh, the criteria for diverse disorders, are trying to base these criteria on empirically sound studies. And we do not have a single study in, on, anorexic, uh, on, on patients with anorexia nervosa that have actually, has actually looked at whether or not these uh, patients are refusing to maintain their body weight. Um, and if you look at current psychiatric interviews that are being used to diagnose anorexia nervosa, please also note that in these interviews, none of the questions actually specifically address the word uh, refusal. So I think we have a problem here, and I think this is a uh, subject that needs to be debated for the classification of DSM-5. Now, to make a long story short, this actually got me started in research in, on uh, anorexia nervosa back in 1996. Uh, this study was published in the uh, International Journal of Eating Disorders at that time point, and we were interested in trying to, to find out what does this 85% average body weight actually mean? What does it imply in epidemiological terms? And what we did is we calculated the BMI values corresponding to 85% average body weight, and then entered these um, BMI values, age dependently, into BMI centiles. And then we were able to see that actually this criterion um, leads to BMI values in the range of between the fifth and tenth BMI centile. So this was the first indication of how severe the underweight in this disorder actually is, and uh, we, we can see that there's a substantial overlap with underweight individuals in the general population. Actually, this applies to several different populations, at least uh, European and uh, American populations. The, uh, cent low, the, the absolute um, BMI values um, of uh, equivalent to the fifth and tenth BMI centiles overlap to a substantial degree. Now, this is a German BMI centile um, curve, and as you can see, typically um, at birth BMI after birth BMI increases rapidly. This is a rapid uh, growth of fat in the organism. After that, there's much more height growth, and actually BMI declines during um, early childhood. And then after, let's say, about age uh, six to seven, BMI consistently uh, actually increases, and this increase actually uh, extends to adulthood. Now, typically, um, at least uh, in European countries, and particularly in Germany, for instance, we have a definition of obesity in childhood because you can't use, of course, the same criteria as, as, the, as in the WHO classification for adults. You can see that we use the 97th centile. Uh, for overweight, you, we use uh, the 90th centile. And as I just showed, uh, you can equivalent the DSM-4 criterion to roughly um, a BMI below the 10th uh, centile. Now, actually, in Germany, we were very fortunate. Actually, this might be convenient to other countries as well, because, as I said, the centiles in the lower centile range overlap quite consistently between different countries. You can actually use this, uh, if you can speak, understand some German, <laughs> you can use this. And uh, if you enter uh, data, you can actually enter the, the body height, body weight, 
uh, age and gender of an individual uh, up to age 18, and you will get the uh, calculation of not only BMI, but also the centile, and you can also get uh, BMI SDS value indicating of how much below a standard deviation uh, this particular BMI, uh, how many standard deviations below the no normal I mean this uh, individual's BMI actually is, is. And then you can look at it graphically. So this is a very good, elegant system to actually assess the um, BMI of, in, for instance, individuals with anorexia nervosa. I can only recommend it to you. Now, just to point out some um, aspects of um, what happens during the age period uh, between or during adolescence and early adulthood, well, you can s these are the BMI values, the absolute BMI values corresponding to the 10th uh, BMI uh, centile according to American, to American, large American study, the Enhance 1 study. And as you can see, actually, the, um, the 10th centile, the absolute BMI corresponding to the 10th centile in the age period 10 to 12 is 15.6. And you can see that it increases and that there is a somewhat of a stagnation uh, in females during the period, let's say, between 18 and uh, 29. You can see that there's only minimal increase. Uh, you can see that in males, the, these values increase more consistently throughout development. And um, I would also like to point out that, that uh, if you, uh, for instance, look at DSM-4 and ICD-10, you can also find an alternative weight criterion of uh, uh, pertaining to the BMI of below 17.5. And please note, of course, that a BMI of 17.5 in 10 to 12-year-olds is actually uh, compatible with about the 50th centile. So you'd be making a huge mistake of using this value here, which it would be appropriate of, for individuals in the age range of 15 to 16 years, but is, again, not strict enough if you look at... Um, uh, is, is too strict, actually, if you look at older uh, individuals. You can see that, actually, the 10th centile, equivalent to 85% average body weight at this age period would be around 18, 18.5, uh, and, of course, the BMI of 17.5 would be inferring a much more stricter uh, weight criterion for anorexia nervosa. So, if you are thinking of DSM-5, we would uh, consider uh, revising this weight criterion, and we suggest that uh, weight is below a minimally normal weight for age and height, uh, leaving out the word refusal, as I just uh, tried to illustrate, and as a guideline, we suggest uh, that a minimally normal weight for age and height is defined as a body mass index uh, below the 10th uh, uh, percentile of the reference population. Now, I will try to address some other clinical issues um, when you're dealing with patients with anorexia nervosa, and one is that uh, there is actually quite a substantial correlation between your referral BMI, so when a patient comes to you as an inpatient, you uh, get her BMI at referral, and then you attempt to calculate her pre-morbid BMI. This is a somewhat complex manner, a uh, um, uh, complex uh, act, because of course you can only rely on recalled data, in most cases at least, but patients I think remember very well, and their families too, their parents, uh, what the highest weight was or what the body weight was at the time the eating disorder began. And because most patients are actually already 13, 14 years old, there is not very much uh, more of uh, growth in height. So you can actually use her current height to calculate the premorbid BMI. So you basically all, only need to, at least in individuals older, let's say than uh, 14 and older, you only need to look at um, the um, weight prior to initiation of the eating disorder and use the current body height to calculate pre-morbid BMI. And if you do that, you can see that there's a quite, really a quite a substantial correlation between um, BMI at referral. This is BMI at referral. You can see individuals that come in with a very, very low BMI tend to also have had very low 
pre-morbid BMI centiles. So these are pre-morbidly underweight individuals who, uh, when they develop anorexia nervosa, end up with lower BMIs at referral. Vice versa, if you look at these individuals up here, you can see they have high uh, BMIs at referral, uh, but they uh, also had very, or, or actually stem from the overweight or obese um, weight categories prior to initiation of the eating disorder. And this correlation is actually is about uh, R equal uh, 0.6. So it's, it's quite amazing that you can come up with such a correlation for, uh, for BMI referral in relationship to pre-morbid BMI. Now, the story is similar, but in some ways opposite. Uh, if you look at uh, weight loss, you see uh, the um, weight loss in BMI units. As you would expect, the pre-morbidly underweight actually lose, have to lose, or lose only uh, uh, a lot less uh, weight than those who had a, uh, who were overweight or obese uh, prior to the eating disorder, premorbidly. So these individuals here, for instance, lose like almost uh, uh, 10, around 10 BMI units, which is uh, really a very uh, substantial weight loss, w whereas some of these here only uh, had weight loss of uh, two, equivalent to uh, two BMI units. Now this is also important. There are some controversies here, but I think the major Problems pertain to that actually studies are not large enough. There's a lot of confusion of what to look at. Should we be looking at weight loss? Should we be looking at BMI at referral? Uh, terms are not used consistently. There's a lot of confusion in, uh, also pertaining to use of different uh, um, weight classification schemes at, ref uh, for, uh, at referral. But what we, what we did in this study, we used actually five follow-up studies and we categorized BMI at referral according to uh, whether or not the patient had a BMI of below 13 or above 13. And in total, we had 272 patients in this study, including adults. Uh, this, m the majority of the patients were uh, adolescent, but uh, some adults, one study included uh, adults. Um, and what you can see is that the BMI at referral actually, in this study, very nicely predicted outcome, uh, not only in terms of mortality. Please no note that uh, of these 100 patients, 11 had deceased during uh, an average length of follow-up of 10 years, 11% versus zero, one patient out of 172, equivalent to 0.6%. And please also observe that, and I think this is even more important, please also observe that if you look at weight at follow-up or BMI at follow-up, uh, note these uh, tremendous differences. So if you ask yourselves how many patients uh, remain below the, um, uh, the threshold value of 17.5 at, at, at follow-up, 35% in this group versus 12.8, below 5th centile, 44, 20%, and 10 south, 56% versus 29%. And as expected, uh, overweight or obesity defined according to the adult uh, WHO classification, please note that there is a, um, actually none of these patients or there's not a substantial risk for uh, overweight in, in either one of the two groups. Um, so we have the problem that, I mean, many, many different um, studies have been trying to uh, address the relevance of body weight at referral. And the problem is that not only very few meta-analyses have been performed in the field. So everybody has been performing their own follow-up study, but only very limited amount of pooling of data sets to really address this important issue. And it is and therefore impossible to assess the prognostic relevance of body weight at referral in published follow-up studies. As I said, many of these studies are using different uh, classification schemes for body weight, percent average body weight, percent ideal body weight, weight unadjusted for height, BMI. So it's just, I would say, a mess. Uh, and it's actually a pity. I think it's, it's shameful that we are uh, using so many different uh, classification schemes 
and that we thus are unable to actually really assess this clinically uh, important uh, problem based on previously, uh, on, previously, uh, uh, on previously published studies or are not in a good position to really look at this issue. Uh, we do not have um, data on diseased patients, so of course follow-up studies report on diseased patients, but they do not report of the, for instance, the BMI at referral of such diseased patients. Uh, we frequently have uh, the outcome criteria as based on the Morgan and Russell uh, criteria, which not only addresses weight but adds menstruation to this. This might, in clinical terms, of course, this is uh, this is uh, relevant, but it might be um, confusing the issues here. And as you can see here, Morgan and Russell actually define good weight outcome as a weight of um, uh, below 80, uh, above 85 uh, percent and uh, below 115 percent average body weight. So you have a, a the good a poor overweight or obesity would be according to these classification seems would be a poor weight outcome. Of course, overweight and obesity is quite something different than uh, maintaining a, a body weight in the anorectic um, uh, weight range. And as it, as all of this uh, confusion actually precludes systematic meta-analysis based on published data. So coming to the uh, clinical uh, implications, I like to ask patients about their pre-morbid body weight uh, prior to first weight loss uh, and their age at that time point. Then this allows us to calculate BM, pre-morbid uh, BMI using measured current height. Uh, we determine BMI percentile for age at initial weight loss, and this gives you an idea of, uh, of where the individual actually, uh, um, um, what BMI percentile, what weight category in relationship to her age group this patient had at the beginning of her eating disorder. Um, of course, the uh, centiles are in even more so BMI SDS values allow us to uh, estimate or get a good idea of the degree of uh, underweight of the individual patient. And this is particularly, uh, as I showed, showed you, particularly this uh, group of uh, adolescents with BMI values below 13 seem to be at an elevated risk, as I showed you, not only for mortality, but also for maintenance of a rather low body weight at follow-up, at least during a, a, the, the data I showed you pertain to a, an on average 10-year follow-up. Um, it is helpful for determination of the target weight. Um, we in Germany, uh, again, you will not find very many uh, studies on this, and there is confusion in this field. Actually, how have we should we maybe be making these patients? What, what is the goal of our uh, weight restitution? Um, and we in Germany use these BMI centiles and uh, we uh, attempt to achieve the 10th centile in all cases, um, but actually aim for the 20th, uh, 25th centile uh, if the patient is able to uh, uh, gain that amount of weight. We use these centile curves to illustrate the course of BMI to both a patient and uh, her parents. And we have um, uh, some uh, experience with uh, groups of patients, but also uh, parents, uh, in which uh, we cover these aspects. And then these, the, both patients, but also parents, uh, will then better grasp the issues. And, and uh, actually, in, in patient groups, they um, are, uh, they, they actually uh, speak about uh, both their pre-morbid BMI uh, or their pre-morbid um, weight um, in relationship to these centiles and that they perceive this as something being very interesting and very close to, uh, to them. Now briefly, I won't be touching this uh, at length, but uh, briefly I would like to uh, show you uh, two slides for um, bulimia nervosa. As you can see, DSM-4 states that individuals with bulimia nervosa typically are within the normal weight range, although some may be slightly underweight or overweight. So this is not that helpful. The disorder occurs but is uncommon among moderately and morbidly obese individuals. So again, there's not a very clear-cut understanding of what's going on. 
There are suggestions that prior to the onset of bulimia nervosa, individuals with this eating disorder are more likely to be overweight than their peers. Indeed, uh, Fairburn and co-workers have uh, consistently um, reported that uh, indeed uh, individuals or adolescents uh, or patients with bulimia nervosa, both adolescents and uh, adults, um, with this eating disorder are, have a, an increased risk or, of childhood uh, obesity or had more, more, more frequently had childhood obesity than uh, you would expect by chance. Just, uh, Anke will later on be uh, showing the same slide. I won't be going into the molecular genetic uh, aspects of this slide, but just again to show you the use of these BMI centiles. This is a, a group of um, uh, 81 consecutively ascertained uh, patients in Prien. These are adults at, at Professor Fichter in, in Prien, who is the largest, I think, the largest hospital for eating disorder patients worldwide. And uh, actually, we ascertained 81 patients, adult patients with bulimia nervosa. You can see the age range of these uh, patients. And um, look at their, their uh, distri weight distribution or BMI distribution according to 10th, 50th, and 90th BMI centile. And please observe that there indeed seemingly is an elevated, uh, actually not only elevated uh, risk of pre-morbid uh, obesity, but also that uh, in this, at least in this group, and I think there are more studies of this kind required, uh, in this group, uh, the, the, you, have, you find more individuals with uh, obesity than you would expect uh, by uh, chance. But also, the, you, you can see that uh, there is uh, quite a bit of loading uh, here on the 10th centile, uh, indeed implicating that maybe we have uh, somewhat abnormally distributed uh, BMI in these bimodal distribution, actually a pre a preponderance of perhaps both uh, lower weight uh, patients with bulimia nervosa and obese patients. Of course, their weight can't go much lower than the 10th centile because then you would expect amenorrhea to uh, appear in these individuals and thus uh, they would no longer classify for a diagnosis of bulimia nervosa, but instead you would then uh, consider anorexia nervosa. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I hope I have been able to convey some of the importance related to clinical issues uh, pertaining to body weight in patients with eating disorders. Thank you. So, I don't know if we're allowed to have a dis brief, brief discussion. One or two questions, if any, in the auditorium. Please use the microphones if you have questions. If not, then we will um, continue with the uh, second talk uh, given by Christian Holtkamp, as I said, from Aachen, who will... I'm sorry. One question. Can you hear if I don't use the microphone? Yes, I can hear you, and I will repeat the question. Okay, so the question, I, uh, just very briefly to repeat, uh, the question is, uh, among those patients who were premorbidly overweight or obese, why would we be uh, per, uh, referring to the 25th, 10th or 25th centile and not trying to go for a higher BMI? Um, you're, you, there are no data uh, giving us any really hardcore evidence to what way or what goal to actually pursue. So this is... I mean, this is just a reflection that we have come up with. Um, the problem that we have with patients in this age category is that if, you, if they had been obese premorbidly or overweight premorbidly, I would be very reluctant to actually ask them to again become overweight um, after, their, uh, this, uh, uh, after recovery from their eating disorder. I think they... In the long term, they will um, be prone to develop a, a higher body weight, but 
I wouldn't um, see the necessity to actually uh, do this in one sort of uh, therapeutic um, stage. And instead, I would just rely on time and uh, be happy with the patient actually achieving the 25th centile and, and hoping, first of all, that this weight might also be beneficial in terms of uh, restoration of menstruation. And then to uh, potentially, if she can keep that weight, I would, I would speculate that she has a higher risk of actually going back up again. And even this, this subgroup of patients might also be the group that goes on to develop bulimia nervosa. So um, I would be careful of, of using premorbid weight as a criterion for the target weight.